Okay. You're recording? Yes, yes. We think we're ready. Okay. Thanks. We think we're ready. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, so today we have Doug Gallo. He is teaching on what every Christian should know about a lesson from his pilgrimage. If it's doing that with my voice, it's going to do that with his. <laughs> it's just softer. Uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. So he gave me this bio. Are you ready? So Doug was born in Missouri, the show me state, and true to its reputation, he's naturally skeptical and equally curious. After college, Doug spent 10 years as a high school social studies and religion teacher, living, teaching, and traveling around the world. This also led to many opportunities for travel and direct exposure to and interactions with world religions. His experiences have allowed him to meditate in Buddhist monasteries, trace Paul's footsteps at Mars Hills in Hill in Athens, dance with whirling dervishes in Morocco, and serve at Mother Teresa's missionaries of charities in Calcutta. Exposure to all of the above and much more simply cannot leave someone the same. He has deconstructed and is still reconstructing his understanding and practice of Christianity. He's here today to share some of his experiences and lessons learned on his pilgrimage. Perhaps this will be of some use to you on your journey and help us identify as a group who we would like to invite for further sessions to broaden our own understanding of our faith and that of our neighbors. Doug and his wife are members of the congregation in Duke Chapel and attend regularly with their two children. Carmelita's out there too. Okay, Doug, thank you. Well, thank you. And I should start by saying I cannot tell you what you should know about world religions. It's an impossible task. I can only say that I have been a little more intentional than a lot of people in trying to figure it out. And um, I can share part of that here. Uh, if there are any questions, I will repeat them because I don't think they can hear them online. Uh, and some I do welcome questions. Some natural questions that I haven't included in the content would might be where I was working when I was living at these various places I'm going to highlight, where I attended church, or um, probably not realistic, but who was my barber? And I only say that to say I've probably learned as much about world religions and politics and barbershops around the world as I have in any other uh, divinity schools. If I have even as much as a two-hour layover in any airport when I used to travel extensively, I would go to a barber and um, I still have a passion for, for barbershops. Um, probably the most interesting being, well, in the West Bank in Israel, I love I love a straight razor shaves, but just if I could do that, I, I just feel like I learn more in those types of settings as I do from reading books or from um, anything else. So, um, so um In my journey, I would say that Duke Chapel, where we have come now, um, is the ideal church at this point in my journey. I am as comfortable at home here as I have ever been anywhere. I've also been extremely comfortable and thought I've had all the answers before. And I am just a pilgrim, as I would say, as are you, whether you know it or not. Even if you are secure in what you think you know to be true, um, you don't know what news you might get today on the way home or what life event could happen or what else could cause you to shake your foundation that, that you uh, do have. Um, I am here, as we had mentioned, my family, we are members here at Duke Chapel. We did make it to college game day yesterday. Did not expect a uh, large group in attendance today <laughs> to the event. And this is my wife, Carmelita. I would also say, having been on my journey at times, and let's see if it's better here or there. It might be a matter of positioning. Um, at times it has felt like I'm in an interfaith marriage simply because I have wrestled with you know, making some volume adjustments. Um, my own faith in a number of ways and just interacted. And so it's, um, um, it's, Lovely to be home at Duke Chapel here because I do feel like this is probably the, in 13 years of marriage, um, the most comfortable we have ever been for our children, um, our worship opportunities, the 
uh, from uh, Christmas to Easter to a college game day to the lectures that are hosted at the campus. And this is as much at home as I have ever been. And um, on my journey, this is where we are. Uh, well, my journey started in, oh, actually, I'm going to skip this due to time. And I'm, well, I'll vaguely mention this just so we have some context. This is from the Q Forum on Religion and Public Life, their uh, most recent, which is older, but uh, large, very comprehensive, a global survey, just to have a little bit of context. And that's, there's the pie chart, and then there's in billions off to the side, just for a little bit of context of world religions, just to, before I kind of enter into my my uh, little story, we won't dig into any of that here um, either. Um, I will start by just, or the format is kind of as, um, I'm going to explain where I lived and as much as possible, just give a highlight of a lesson that I learned. And for me, it starts in Springfield, Missouri. Um, we'll also give a little bit of context into exposure of other religions that I had. Let's move that down to the bottom. That's still okay for everyone. Um, interactions or authors that I've had some um, that, that are relevant there at the bottom. But this general format through through the next seven or eight slides. When we come back, what I want to do to kind of keep an eye on time is highlight who is here on campus that we think as an adult forum we would like to invite. And I think this came out of um, this came out of the um, the Christian Education Committee's discussion of guest speakers and topics. And I'm already looking ahead at what is coming up, and I'm looking behind at the years and years of topics, which are incredibly rich from my standpoint. Some of the best content, like a master class in in uh, theology and Christianity, that have existed here in in this forum at um at duke chapel but i think this current group there's some interest in in uh, exploring who's around on campus and resources that we can learn from directly so this is just kind of a sense to to uh, generate thought discussion and questions um as the question has been my best friend um as i've been on my journey and uh that started with my uh, questions in springfield missouri uh, I grew up reading Mark Twain, somewhat idolizing Mark Twain. Um, I will highlight that at the very front of the bookstore right across campus is the quote, I, ne I never let my schooling interfere with my education from Mark Twain. And, and that has very much been uh, my story. Most of what I've learned, I genuinely have learned in, in outside of the formal classroom, even though I have that side of, 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 of what I've done. So, uh, well, growing up in Springfield, Missouri, the geographic center of the U.S., and arguably the buckle on the Bible Belt, um, just this basic thoughts that I had, I, which was I'm only a Christian because my parents are. I don't know, and, and that's pretty elementary, but it can be troubling if you've never unpacked it, but it, I think the, the lesson that I'm presenting that I've learned is most religious adherents are simply a product of their geography and upbringing. Uh, that's most, there's a lot of others who have the opportunities, exposure and interest in learning more and therefore in uh, um, the changing. And my particular exposure was through the Baptist tradition um, and Springfield, Missouri is the headquarters of the Assemblies of God denomination as well. Um, when I was a kid, I was within walking distance of two Bible colleges. They were long walks, let, let's say within bike riding distance. Um, Baptist Bible College and Central Bible College. One was the Baptist and one was the Assemblies of God. And whenever the Spartans and the Patriots would meet twice a year, it was just musty basketball and the, the little uh, field houses there in, 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 in uh, Springfield. I will say too that the BBC is the home of Jerry Falwell, who then went on to found, a, or not the home, where he, his um, alma mater, before he went on to found Liberty University. Just, uh, so it did have some exposure to him as well, kind of a growing up. But um, just some other random thoughts from that was, uh, I'm not saying that I, there wasn't 
authentic Christianity, but I'm saying that <laughs> there seem to be extremes. It's either you were all in or you were on drugs and your life fell apart and you were like just on the extreme of things and that there wasn't like just a, a middle. And um, it, it, that was just one of my first observations. Also, just the style and the format was such that it didn't really resonate with me. It was a lot of yelling. And I would just sit there and whether tent revivals or um, things that were coming through. And it was just a thought, this is really long and hot. And why are you yelling at me? Like, it was just that that style in, in, in a format. I um, went off to college, the first one in my family to attend college. I studied physical education uh, north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Look here. Uh, actually, in the Dunbar, Wisconsin. Um, I was there five, actually, yeah, six years. I liked the teachers a lot. Um, sorry, it's an old joke. <laughs> I was working my way through school um, in uh, well, a variety of jobs from um, uh, a cook at a restaurant to working in a, a steel mill to doing whatever it took just to pay the bills because I was the first one to go off to college and and um, had to kind of fund myself through it. Then I stayed for a year studying a theology and a master's program um, for an additional year. Um, and it was there that I really realized kind of apart from the faith I was exposed to as a child that, wow, there's like, there's some robust philosophical components here. My exposure to C.S. Lewis, which I'm sure all of us have had some interaction with before. One that was really interesting to me uh, out of Colorado Springs, his name was David Noble. And I think he had a massive textbook called Understanding the Times where he just kind of charted society and culture and made this massive uh, kind of robust philosophical argument for Christianity. Um, not necessarily sound, like it wouldn't stand up to scrutiny, um, but it gave me some like, oh, this is really fascinating. I was involved. Uh, it was a, a Christian college. I attended a Baptist college and um, I was involved in some campus ministry at Northern Michigan University that was interaction, uh, interacting on the university, seeking to convert um, the heathen at the um, at the local school um, 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 up there. Um, and probably one of the most significant parts in my life, really, was that I was home in, let's say, Springfield. By this time, we had moved towards Branson, Missouri. And you might have heard of a Silver Dollar City. That's not where I worked. Um, that was the cool spot. Um, I worked at a, a smaller <laughs> craft village called Mutton Hollow that my wife still laughs at every time she hears Mutton Hollow. It's no longer there either. <laughs> but I was I, I was a um, I would run Jake's Rib House, this little like a barbecue stand for the summer. I'd just been doing it since high school, and my boss one summer, like I was the constant. I, I knew how to open up Jake's and how to smoke everything and sell for lunch and then shut down by the afternoon. And then it was just like this daytime part, but I had a new boss one summer that, that, that was there. And he was a, a sociology after I, I, I forget his background. He was anti-religious. It was my first exposure to a true antagonistic, not non-Christian, but anti-Christian, anti-religious perspective. And then he had a very, um, from his standpoint, interesting, a coworker that he had heard about that would that could run Jake's Rib House for the summer, and I did that pretty well. Um, but he really started to, well, he attacked my faith, and he totally dismantled my faith. And that's whenever I was was finding these resources of of, of uh, C. S. Lewis, and I don't know if Robbie Zacharias was around yet. That was a little bit later, but just some of the um, options to tap into to help me understand. Wait, is this even? Am I wasting my time going to this Christian college? Is this all a farce? Because he had really um, kind of rocked my faith, which wasn't really that solid, but it was it was rocked nonetheless. So then I went back and I was at a Christian college and I was able to really for the first time uh, own it as as far as, wow, I'm really into this. This makes sense. I, um, I, I want to... to 
both practice it and to spread it as much as possible. That led to my first uh, overseas trip, which was still the U.S., but to the island of Guam. I guess the town was the Baraguada, Baraguada. I can stop for any questions or comments at this point if anyone has anything. I have about seven or eight of these that I'm on my way through. Any questions or comments thus far? Concerns? <laughs> um, and Nelson, are we good there on the audio with everyone? You can give me a thumbs up if uh, we're tracking. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Uh, so I moved to the island of Guam as a teacher and I um, taught some physical education and I taught the religion courses. This particular school was a very Christian school that was connected loosely to the college that I had attended. And I was teaching middle schoolers and I loved it. And I was also kind of working in the youth group or leading the, the youth group at the church as well. It was a church affiliated school. And my students were from all over the world. Um, a lot of uh, families from throughout Asia, they recognize Guam. If you can get to Guam and if you're, if you can have a child in Guam, they become a U.S. citizen. And that leads to the opportunity to go to college in the U.S. because you have a, you're a citizen and passport. So, so uh, we had University of Guam, which had professors from somewhat around the world. And our school, which was a, a private Christian school, was also attractive, not necessarily because it was Christian, but because it was affordable, safe, a, a quality education in English with the good teachers that came from America. And so my students, and uh, were always with packed, packed classrooms, up to 30, were extremely diverse and just young middle schoolers and their parents, and they would invite us all over for the birthday parties and the celebrations. And so I'm like a truly... A, massive minority like there's outside of the military presence and a few other folks that might have stayed after after being deployed in guam or something um so both a minority as being a white male both a minority as being let's say a, a protestant except for this little school that i had worked at so while teaching religion classes even though i thought i had all the answers and i'm just trying to explain the basics of christianity to students that have no context to understand it um, and a lot of questions and myself being or attempting to be intellectually honest, it really opened everything up again because they were asking questions I didn't have answers to or they were asking questions and I knew that my answers weren't right or I was learning about their religions and their, their family's experiences. But everything I had been told was a misrepresentation of what we're now friends. And not to overstate it, but it was... It, I had just realized that there is a natural tendency to privilege your own religion and to misrepresent and misunderstand all others. And this is true of Christians. And I, well, I can only say it's true of Christians. <laughs> I also presume it's a natural human tendency. And um, so It really caused me to want to explore and learn that much more about world religions in their context. Um, my particular exposure, well, that was down below. I don't think there's anything great to highlight there. After being there for six years, um, I had tried to join the United States State Department. And at the time, the test was rigorous, and I almost made it until the end as a foreign service officer, but did not. And if you didn't, you had to restart the whole process again. But either way, my uh, brother was in Washington, D.C. Uh, I had, oh, and just to highlight, I was in D.C. I was a teacher in Guam during 9-11, which is just kind of, I think, a significant point in all of our lives uh, related to religion and the understanding religion or misunderstanding religion and the religion's impact on, on global events and the dangers of not understanding religion or of minimizing the role that religion plays in the way that people think. So all of these things, I think, are just kind of like a shared mutual experience. So, so uh, this was my first exposure to D.C. Uh, I still was trying to either get in with the State Department or the Peace Corps or any sort of other international organization. While I was there, I interned for... Um, a, a congressman while on Capitol Hill. Um, also, 
had exposure to Oz Guinness. Has anyone ever heard of Oz Guinness? I was, he is of the Guinness beer family from Ireland. He is from Ireland. Um, and um, he has an organization in D.C. called the Trinity Forum, which is um, deep intellectual Christian thought. He's an, ax, an Oxford graduate and a philosopher. And his book, which I don't have here, The Long Journey Home, was while I was in Guam, the book that truly kind of set me on my journey. And, sorry, I'm kind of back, back and forth on the, um, the years here. But he framed the understanding of religions by faith families, which could be its own little session. And the book itself, I do recommend. And anything by Oz Guinness, I also highly uh, do recommend. But The Long Journey Home groups religions by faith families, somewhat worldviews, and is a great framework for um, understanding the, the different approaches to religion, which is its own other kind of side, little uh, uh, a session that we could do. But he was in D.C. Uh, he attends the Falls Church, Episcopal Church in or Anglican in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, so I could go there. I could attend their events. On the anniversary of 9-11, the Dalai Lama was speaking at the National Cathedral, and I was in Guam for 9-11, but the first year anniversary, I was in D.C., so I was able to wait in the long line and hear the Dalai Lama speak on, I think, world peace, I forget the topic, but at the National Cathedral in D.C. I play a lot of soccer, and I had a lot of friends that we... Um, I just would interact with at the park and play soccer with also kebab palace in crystal city, Virginia. My uh, brother and I had just, we just made friends with, with, with the average people who were immigrants to America trying to make it that were from Muslim countries. I think it's the best way to describe them. And um, whether it was kebab palace and right next to it, a shisha palace, or we would smoke a hookah way back then uh, just, fruit flavored tobacco, uh, even though I'm, I'm in a safe space, but still. Um, so learned as much from this average Muslims that had come to America and were just reflecting, especially in the, the shadow or the recent history of 9-11 when there was still um, this great concern and lack of understanding about Islam and, and, and religion and such. And then just all of the other DC uh, think tanks that I would um, somewhat come and go with. The uh, again, the uh, Pew Forum on Religion and and uh, Public Life. If you have any interest in anything like this, there is no organization like the Pew Forum. So you can subscribe to their emails. They're they're doing and funding the best research on on everything that matters from this uh, standpoint. Um, at Georgetown University, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs is also just phenomenal resources. And uh, I was preparing to go on my next trip. At the time, I was just working both for Marriott and Delta Airlines. But if I had any free time in my schedule, um, I was at attending events at any of these that I could. Also at Georgetown, the Center for Islamic Understanding, uh, they have really kind of the uh, premier Islamic scholar, uh, John Esposito, that, that was there and doing lots of these events. And then, as I had mentioned, the Trinity Forum and the C.S. Lewis Institute. I didn't put it in the slide because it just looks weird whenever you hear it. But I had a colleague at Delta, and every time we were in the break room and Fox News was on, and Fox News has the perpetual American flag banner. And he would just walk into the break room and uh, he was from, uh, I forget his name, and he has no idea he has impacted my life in this way. Um, but he would walk into the break room and he would see Fox News on the TV and he would say, God bless America and nobody else. And it was just this phrase. I'm like, what? What's he saying? And then it's like, what? what is our national motto, God bless America. Is it a, is it intentionally exclusionary? Why is he adding and nobody else? Exclamation point, question mark. And um, 
he has caused me to wrestle with patriotism and nationalism and anywhere else that I've traveled. And I'll present you with a question. We don't have to unpack it here. And I don't have the answer, even though I'm, on most of these things, I might have some thoughts I can uh, attribute, but I still have more questions than answers. Um, and I'll, I'll set the context for this question. I was driving from Branson, Missouri, out to my uh, mom's house, past, again, Mark Twain Middle School. This is probably sometime in 2005 or six. And I saw on the sign, virtue of the week, the patriotism. And the thought that just hit me, and it, it will not leave, is patriotism a Christian virtue? Is patriotism a Christian virtue? So that's that, that uh, <laughs> it's been a burden I've been living with ever since the unknown the co worker from Delta has stated, God left America and nobody else. And so um, that, there's kind of a subcontext here. This isn't just religion, it's kind of a culture, nationalism politics, everything is kind of interwoven here. We'll say one other thing, and I happen to have this this book, and how am I doing on time? Because I can do this slower, fast, or I think we're okay. I, I took an interest in, or I heard something about, well, after 9-11, there became a great amount of conspiracy theories, okay? Was it an inside job? Was it, you can name the, you know, and there still are conspiracy theories that exist. And at the time, and I'm going to preface this, an anti-Islamic scholar, I think he's Jewish, and I'm not recommending the book, but I'm saying the book that I read at that time is this book called Conspiracy. How the paranoid style flourishes and where it comes from. I thought it was just a random book that I happened to read to make sense of why don't people believe what we know to, to happen? And I literally went over to like A1 Auto Care because I lived right up the hill from the Pentagon and I saw witnesses that saw the plane come in and clip to the tower outside of A1 Auto Care in Arlington, Virginia before it, 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 it hit the Pentagon. It wasn't a, you know, there's all, all types of stories and, and conspiracies regarding this. But, but the gist of this book, and this is just interesting as well, just as a side note that might come back when I'm, later in Morocco, but conspiracy theories thrive where there is not a free press and where there is not, and where there are theocracies. So in theory, in the Islamic world, you can expect more conspiracy theories to originate and flourish because there's what happened and then there's what the king told you what happened. So you naturally will have alternative viewpoints as you should in a skeptical, normal way. But then what had happened, what we now know, we don't even, a significant portion in our country do not know who our president is, or we cannot even agree. So to, to see this like random book come from almost 20 years ago that I read, and now to look at the state that I'm in, in my own country, of how conspiracy theories, particularly through the internet, right? I mean, the internet was largely irrelevant and social media, and then just the growth and spread of them. And I just, while I'm on it, I have to give the one quote um, that is, I think, the most liberating thing on conspiracy theories, the closest if we don't open it back up. Conspiracy theories are the sophistication of the ignorant. Uh, you're not informed, but you can make anything up, but you can't disprove it because you made it up. So there's no ability to disprove something that's completely fictional. So they get legs because I say ignorant, like not dumb, but necessarily, but, but people who don't realize that the fact that it can't be disproven because it has no basis in reality still doesn't give it credence. It just means it's a conspiracy theory. Conspiracies are real. I can conspire to do something. Conspiracy theories are dangerous. But um, let me move on from that pet peeve. Just when I was looking th through my books to get ready for this, I thought, oh, wow, this one is, is a still relevant, which I thought was just an obscure book that I had picked up that now I see be a somewhat true. Um, let me move this one. So then I, true to Oz Guinness and wanting to understand religions, um, Oz 
grew up in India and Nepal. And uh, India as the birthplace of Buddhism and the origin of Hinduism and Jainism, it was a must see. And there was an opportunity that opened up at Woodstock School in Missouri, India. They needed a, a, a religious education teacher for one year. The person I was replacing was going to Oxford to work on his a PhD or, or master's in religion. And they had a one-year opening, which in the world of international education, you don't usually find a one-year round-trip airfare, full salary, two months off in December and January paid. So this was like a can't-miss opportunity. So um, I moved to India. Uh, the exposure was great. Um, Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, Jainism, missionaries of charity. I attended an Anglican church on the hillside um, in Missouri. It was If you're in the U.S., Missouri would be like a boulder or Estes Park. You're not on the plains, but you're up away in the mountains. And the British had used it as their um, hill station retreat for the military officers. You familiar with Woodstock or Missouri? A couple of movies. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so an unbelievable experience, the most life-changing thing that I could ever have. I could probably give an entire session of what I learned on India or just uh, um, stories or books or um, events, but I'll try to, to uh, summarize it. And this school was historically a Christian school, but was not operating as a Christian school. The year I was there, um, it had uh, celebrated its 150th birthday for the year that I was there. And um, the students were from around the world. Their um, admission goals were one third from India, one third from the rest of Asia, in one third from the rest of the world. So it truly was and is a absolutely remarkable international boarding school. Um, Sharon, yes, Sharon Jones is who attends Duke uh, Chapel. Her dad was a former administrator there. So we have connected over that and um, there is some interest in, um, as a chapel or as friends, going to the Hindu temple in Kerry, which is one of the largest in North America, and having lunch at an, a very authentic Indian restaurant that she exposed me to that I've been to now twice. That's very good. Udupai. Um, So I don't want to get bogged down too much in India, but there's a few highlights that I must, um, I must mention. Uh, when let's just cross off, the, off the, the bullet point before I give, give a few more stories. Religious differences are significant, and individual religious belief correlates to culture. Um, it and Mark Twain had been to India as well, um, so it's, in some ways, it felt like whether I wanted to or not, our footsteps had always crossed. Um, it was, again, extremely challenging and incredibly enlightening to interact with the students and to learn from my colleagues and just in the, 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 the mecca of world religions, as it were, I was able to visit the four uh, pilgrimage sites in the Buddhism, where the Buddha was born, where he was died, where he was enlightened. And I forget the other one, like right off, but there throughout India. And Nepal. Uh, and I have another significant lesson that occurred in India, and it was on Christmas Eve. And um, when I wrote on my notes, the Christmas Eve in Varanasi. Varanasi, India is along the Gandhi's River, and it's where you would want to go as a devout Hindu, one of the many cities, but one along the river up close to the mountains where the water is more pure from a religious perspective, not from a, um, a biological perspective. 
it's a tremendous amount of religious activity on one side of the river and um, head shavings and religious ceremonies and most significantly where you would want to die if you could orchestrate your death and then take your final bath in the river religious ceremony. I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just trying to offer context. And then after death, be burned and initiate the reincarnation process. So it is literally the most fascinating place I have ever seen in my life, overwhelming every possible sense, not just smoke in the air, but the smell of burning human flesh that is prevalent because they have just died and now they have initiated the reincarnation process. Again, I, I'm no expert on Hinduism. And I don't want to misrepresent this, but in general, the point is here, if you believe in reincarnation, death really isn't that big of a deal. You're always here and you're never not here. You're just here in different forms. And whenever the ashes go up into the sky and then they come back into the rain, this again, isn't scientific. It's a philosophical approach to how reincarnation happens. And then your soul is in the clouds and it comes back down in the rain and then it gets eaten by, let's say, a cow or an animal. And then you are back now inside of that cow so or that animal. So the way that, again, a religious belief such as reincarnation can impact the view of individuals and not just individuals of a society, there's not necessarily an impact to make any social change. It just is. Um, the, uh, so, yeah, so back to Christmas Eve, not in Sarajevo, if you know that song, but Christmas Eve in Varanasi. Every possible sense is just, and I had already been in the country for three or four months, but just um, was taking it all in at the highest level and almost overwhelmed. And it, again, was Christmas Eve and not just Christmas Eve. I think it was within a day or two of um, the greatest natural disaster of our lifetime, the floods and the earthquakes and the floods that killed hundreds of thousands in India. I was literally on the Ganges River in a uh, taking a, a little tour. I think there was some Japanese tourists and this is in 2004. When texting wasn't really a thing yet, except the Japanese had text messages and they had gotten an alert about this uh, tsunami. And so while I was in there, the full devastation of the hundreds of thousands of, of um, dead in this natural disaster were still taking place. So there's also this global event as a social studies teacher that I'm following the senses, the smell, the, the sounds, the sights, the. Um, and while I'm walking around, I was there alone, just just the backpacking or maybe I was going to meet up with a friend later. And I'm walking down the streets and I heard uh, Christmas carols, like the noise of Christmas carols. And oh my, it was this revolutionary moment. And I followed them along the block until I found it was, and it was a Catholic church in the middle of the city. And it was Christmas Eve and they were having their Christmas Eve service and there were children and there was, there was Christian songs and there was Christian Christmas carols being sung in English. And I walked in and enjoyed that. And that was probably as much of a religious and spiritual moment as I've ever had in my life. And I guess I could add probably even a more significant part is we think there's a lot of differences between the different Christian denominations, and there are. And I'm not saying that they don't matter. Um, even yesterday, my sign that we made on the way to the game was the Methodists are greater than Catholics. I mean, you know, versus Notre Dame. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. <laughs> Let me tell you what, I was never more thankful to be part of the Catholic, the universal church of Jesus Christ at that time, just to have a place to feel comfortable and to be at home. And I, my life wasn't in danger per se. It was just, I was overwhelmed and I'm still quite young and really trying to interpret it all. The other significant aspect here is that while I was traveling India and we were off for two months because our school did not have central heat. Grab a book. I have my backpack and 
it was uh, some on motorcycle and it was some just on trains and it was some on trains and uh, I was on a, a teacher salary. So I could take care of myself okay, but also just for the experience, I went and have taken train rides with the untouchables and the lowest of the, just to be able to experience what it would be like if you were not viewed as the same. Um, but while I'm traveling the country, I also had had a, came across some books at the chaplain's office that I was working out of at the school. And his name was Vishal Mangawadi. Here's just one of his books I'm holding up. This is the book that I read. Missionary Conspiracy, Letters to a Postmodern Hindu. I won't necessarily go into it now, but I'll just give a few highlights of Vishal Mangalwadi. He studied directly under Francis Schaeffer, just for context. Anyone know of Francis Schaeffer? Okay. Um, I won't diverge, but... Um, he was from India. He was attempting to serve the poor. He was a, a Christian. And while he was trying to combat corruption, while he was trying to combat a widow burning, while he was trying to corrupt, uh, to address the humanity and dignity of, of a woman and a children, especially in some cases, again, going back to the differences in some Areas of India, the birth rate, which is always naturally higher for females to male, was 800 females to 1,000 males, which, again, going back to the point of religious impact having a differences, well, what do you have if you have a, a shortage of 200 for everyone? Well, then you have marriages to multiple women, you have an increase of prostitution, like all of these things that seem isolated aren't, like they impact the way that society develops. There's just a correlation between them all. So while Vishal Mangalwadi was doing his work on all this, in a nutshell, he um, was, of course, doing this as a, a Christian, and he began to be attacked, and he wrote some letters highlighting, it was kind of some national disputes, let's say, in some different newspapers between him and some Hindu religious leaders. And this was a series of letters that he wrote explaining, you're attacking the Bible and the Christians, but what you don't know is the and this is controversial, but the good that you do have in your country is from the same Bible that you are attacking. He is and was a controversial uh, uh, figure. But in that point, his interpretation of what I was experiencing was more impactful than anything I could have imagined. Uh, I then went back after the uh, two months of traveling the country, and that was where I had uh, taken a, a group of students to Mother Teresa's in India. So just kind of, it, it's India is a, a triangle, and I had gone down through everywhere, ran the uh, the Mumbai Marathon, and went over to the, to the uh, Sisters of Mercy and kind of made the, uh, the school out. When I got back to the school, I realized his daughter was our school nurse, and then began to core uh, a spawn with him and establish a relationship with him who had at that point moved to Los Angeles. Um, at that point, I also, my year in India was up and cannot stop for here, but this is a book that is a fascinating book. And that's the author. Um, essentially, I moved to Hollywood to help him turn this book into a film series that doesn't exist. But that was the um, that was the a goal. Hollywood Presbyterian Church, um, which is in the middle of Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard at Hollywood and Gower, um, right underneath the Hollywood sign. They had hosted him and they saw him as potential to make a film series in Hollywood. So I lived with him and his wife inside of the uh, the property of Hollywood Presbyterian Church, working on this. Um, uh, 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 a film series. This is on Audible, and I think it's free if you have an account. It's not one that you have to purchase. And I'm not. I love Vishal and I love his wife, and they're they're amazing. I'm not necessarily recommending this book because it has been used going back to God Bless America and nobody else. This book is currently being used right now to justify what we're seeing in America 
as far as the Make America Great Again movement. Not his goal in writing it, but his perspective of America has a secret. And I have to tell you one story. When he came to America for the first time, and he was in Minnesota, and there was um, milk for sale outside of a farm with a cash box and a trailer. He says, I, I can't believe this. In India, we would have taken all the milk, all the cash, and your trailer. How can you just have, like, on the honor system? And again, these things, I just drove by. I work near Lake Forest, and I just saw one yesterday with the pumpkins I brought home Tuesday. There's a mailbox, not attached, a trailer without a lock. It's all there. You just take the pump and you put the money. So his, his overall perspective is you don't even know he's coming in from east to west. What made your country your country? You have a secret, and that secret is the Bible. So he's kind of a prophet in the same way that Alexis de Tocqueville came from France to America um, and wrote his book, which the the, the book, Vishal Nagawati's book here is that, but it, it has been um, missed you some. So um, we were in Hollywood for a year, a year and a half, and uh, never really got the film series going. We had a, um, I had some exposure to Scientology. As anyone, did, anyone does in Hollywood, even if you just pass through, if you want to take hold the things and take the um, anxiety test or something, the stress test, everything's a little like gateway in Kabbalah. Um, we were there on that and. Um, we're still friends, but we the series has never gotten off the ground. He is still lecturing around the world. I then knew I had to go live in a Muslim country and had not yet. So there was an opportunity to teach at George Washington Academy in Casablanca, Morocco. Um, the king of Morocco in 1777 was the first born dignitary of any kind, first foreign state to recognize America as an independent nation. And there's a letter that George Washington, this is not related to, this is just, you can't not tell this story because no one knows this. There is a letter written by George Washington to the King of Morocco in 1777. And the letter itself, you must look this up. We have reason to believe that, you know, our land is fertile, our people are industrious. We have reason to believe that God may favor our nation and we may, and we now know this to be um, America. But um, um, can't get too sidetracked here. But what I can say is that in general, in Morocco, when you live in a, a country where there's not the ability to diversify, religion as we know it doesn't become so much personal as it's just kind of cultural and i would also argue that american that america is a christian nation kind of culturally but that doesn't mean that it's that is it necessarily affects the individual but that was my um insight there there is the only jewish museum in the islamic world is also in casablanca because the king allows it and i would say going back to that too just to highlight the nature of conspiracy theories. And um, anytime you live and the king is ruling on behalf of God, that's where all the power is. And then you can naturally expect there to be questions about everything. Um, and cons cons conspiracy theories existing in a healthy way and a natural way there. Then moved to Loveland, Colorado. And I did some work with group uh, publishing. Uh, we had a concept called Life Tree. Life Tree Cafe and Life Tree Adventures. Um, Life Tree Adventures is still going on. Life Tree Cafe was an attempt to take these questions and host in a, a coffee shop or a bar a discussion on a topic and um, just have interaction for people who wouldn't come to church. The publisher was looking at the data. He saw church attendance dropping. His name's Tom Schultz, so, uh, uh, still a, a good friend, him and his wife. Um, and they wanted the group the publishing is the largest non-denominational publisher in the U.S. So there's the like Lifeway with the, with Southern Baptist and uh, the, the Methodist House and such. But this is um, th they were reaching the non the non-denominational community and they're seeing attendance, their resources, their go down. And this was an attempt to have Life Cafe, but that was. 
That, that picture is from Estes Park, by the way, not, not, not Loveland, but I was able to go up there. Uh, and then Raleigh. Eh. <laughs> well, actually, I met my wife in D.C. And, uh, you, you know, there's no way to kind of summarize everything, but you kind of go through this, you experience thing. And, I'm, you know, the, the creeds that I hear at Duke Chapel, you know, faith as a mystery. Some conclusions I, I have to, I, I practice Christianity. Um, but like, I'll hear individuals say in a very uncomfortable way that we know this, but they don't, or, or, or kind of a way that, that tends to put down other religions. And I, I just kind of have a sense of personally, I don't know what I don't know. I know what I can believe. I know what I can practice. Um, but whenever we die, we, I don't think you can know. And that makes some people uncomfortable because it would be great to have certainty. You can deuce and you, you can have as much as possible, look at the philosophical aspect of, of your faith. But I don't think that we can know, but we can go along the journey together. We can, as much as possible, define what goodness looks like and, and put beauty, truth, and goodness in our lives and to, to uh, serve others. And uh, um. Yeah, that's where I'm kind of currently at, both physically and somewhat from a religious standpoint. Nelson, we're down to just a few minutes. I have a couple other, I could slide through the rest of what I have to kind of set the context for some guests we could invite and some questions we could ask them. That probably the best way to do that. I'm just going to skip through a few slides. Um, based off of all this and looking at who is here, I would suggest that the forum or present to the educational committee that we would invite the Buddhist chaplain at Duke and have him explain a Buddhism in their own words. I would also suggest that we invite the Hindu chaplain, Priya Amaresh, the, and the Muslim chaplain, as far as resources that are right here that are comfortable with Duke that we could have. I think the work would be, or the question would be what, would we want that to look like in this forum? And here are some general questions I've kind of thought of that we might want to ask. And I have my email at the end, or we could send them to um, to Melanie or the ed ed education committee as well. But here's just some to get the thought process flowing. And we could ask them all the same questions. Here's kind of a template. Would you come and speak to us on your religion and answer these questions? Or uh, we could customize them to each one, but um, necessarily want to highlight all these. I would say back on origins and purpose, and if, if I go back a slide, this was significant in my thought process early on. All religions seek to answer, and I like to start with questions of origin, where did we come from, or what is humanity? Uh, what happens when I die, you know, on the other end of life, right? I mean, there's, I mean quite different beliefs from from nothing to reincarnation or to eternity in a good or bad place so those are not small differences um what is our purpose why are we here and morality how do i live so so at least also including these as one of these uh, sub questions here um i i find of uh, great interest but that might not be the interest of the community i just wanted to um offer some initial questions to that going. Uh, I'll try to stay on track with time. It is 1045. Any questions, comments, or corrections? <laughs> I am learning. Uh, and if I have misspoken or misjudged or denigrated anyone's belief or religion, it was not on purpose. Please inform me. And I would like to become more educated because I'm still on my pilgrimage. And I would argue, so are you. So, um, yes, sir. My God is too big for any single religion. Off of a bumper sticker. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that is, you know, and, and that used to feel like that thought would feel like a threat to me at one point in my journey. And now it does not. So, 
Very good. And the third I is Um, yes, the comment was made about, yes, yeah, the impact of a Christianity on a democracy. I will say I, there is one other just high level thought that I have that in all of this, in there's the question of what is there life beyond our earth? Is there life on other planets? And the thought that having gone through this, I cannot get out of my mind. And again, I'm just a... Uh, I'm, I'm I'm no theologian or philosopher of any esteem, but if there was, would they be able to develop as we have based off of our religions on this world and their impact are so significant? And would they replicate them? And I mean, there could be the same Christian God and he could have different planets, but just the role that religion and particularly Christianity and interaction has played I just can't get that thought out of my mind every time I hear is there life on other planets. But I'm going to wrap it up and then I guess hand it off to Melanie. I have a few books up here if you want to browse or chat or take some. Yeah. I say we uh, say thank you to Doug for all of that wonderful information. It's very interesting and thought provoking. Uh, next week, we have Nathan Porter, who is a doctoral student in early Christianity here at Duke University. He will be here to inform us about why be Trinitarian, insights from the early church. So thanks and have a great week. Thank you, Jeff.